I got into film photography this year and here is all you need to know before you dive in yourself. And make sure to hang around because I will also share how you can get 50% off this typewriter text effect. And if that doesn't get your gears turning, maybe the jokes will, because yes, I will drop them that jokes. All right, so I'm still very new to film photography, which means I think I can have a pretty fresh perspective on things. Translation, I still don't really understand how to open all of these things and all of the buttons and gears and twists and turns. But seriously, I have probably just quite recently gone through all of the different things and questions that you have right now. So this video is for beginner film photographers or people who want to get started with their first roll of film. Let's not waste any more time and dive into the different things that you need to know before starting. And let's start with cameras. And as always with cameras, I recommend that you use whatever you have. A lot of people get into film photography because they inherit a camera from a relative. And that is also how I got hooked into this hobby. My granddad gave me his uh, old film cameras from like the 40s and 50s. And I figured if they survived this long, I might give it a try. There's not really any need to go spend money on a camera when you're just starting out. Uh, it's better to just dip your toes in with whatever you have and see if it is something that you like. And if you do try it out with what you have, you will start to know what it is that you are looking for in a film camera so that you later can purchase the thing that you actually want. Because when you're starting out, you're, you're not gonna know what you are looking for. But let's say you don't have a film camera. Well, don't worry, because I've got your back. There are a few different kinds of film cameras to consider. And first of all, you have your disposable cameras. These are like the microwave dinner of the camera world. They are quick and easy, gets the job done, but maybe not the best. And I think you get something like around 26 images from one disposable camera. And all you have to do is just point it towards the subject, press the shutter button, and you're pretty much done. And once all of the images are exposed, just send it away, get your images developed and scanned, and sent back to you. And a disposable camera is usually around 20, 30 bucks, I think. And then you to get it developed and scanned and stuff like that is, I guess, pretty much the same. So you are looking at maybe 40 to 60 bucks for one roll. And next up, we have the second category, and that is the point and shoot. And this is the one that I probably would recommend as the first film camera for most people. You get the convenience of a disposable camera of just pointing and shooting but you get the flexibility of being able to replace the film, shoot different kinds of films, and it's just not a disposable camera. You can use it multiple times. And in this category, you can find both old vintage cameras, but you can also find newer releases like this one here. This is the Kodak Ektar H35. And this is actually a half frame point and shoot camera, which means that you will get double the amount of images from a roll of film because one exposure only covers half of the frame. I don't know if that makes sense. But in short, that just means that you get twice the amount of photos, twice the amount of fun, and twice as many possibilities to fuck up. And the third category is the single lens reflex cameras. And these are pretty much the analog version of the DSLR camera. They have an internal mirror mechanism that allows you to look straight through the viewfinder and pretty much see exactly what the shot is going to look like through the lens. And an SLR camera also allows you to switch out the lens, giving you more control over the photo. It's like upgrading from a scooter to a motorcycle. You're still on two wheels, but you are now in the fast lane. And you can find a lot of great vintage SLR cameras for really good prices as well. Those three categories are Probably what I would recommend someone just starting out. But if you inherited a camera or found one in your grandma's attic, then make sure to look up what you have because there are a lot of different other categories that we are not going to dive deeper into in this video, but here are a few. You have your twin reflex cameras that look something like this one I have here. Then you have your rangefinders, you have your stereos, panoramic, uh, large format, box cameras like this one, I have one here as well. Uh, let's see, there you go. And also pinhole cameras. Before continuing with the video and the bad dad jokes, I just wanted to share how you can get 50% off this typewriter effect here. And all you have to do is to go to the link down in the description and use the code FILMBASICS. It's like getting a steal of a deal without actually needing to steal anything. 
But now, back to the video. That was just the first part of this video. And if you're still here, congratulations. You might actually be someone that can be patient enough to actually shoot film. But now, let's talk about actually choosing what type of film to use. And there are two main types of different film. And the first one being 35mm, which I have in this camera here. And the other one being 120mm. That looks something like this, for example. And one of those two is probably what you are going to need for your camera. But if you're unsure, just do a quick Google search for your camera and what it requires. And if you are using a disposable camera, congrats, you can skip this step. Go get something to drink while I continue talking about film. Because in disposable cameras, they come with a film roll in them. But there is a sea of different types of film. And it is the film that gives the photo that specific look. And for example, this one here is just an Ilford, one, Ilford Delta 100, which is a type of a black and white film. And the film roll is basically just a long roll of film made out of plastic. And on one side, it has been coated with a bunch of different chemicals and silver. So you can think of it like it's your camera's secret sauce that is giving it its flavor. So it is really important to not expose your roll of film to light. You want to expose it to light through the lens, but you don't want to like pull it out because then the roll of film is going to be destroyed. And you don't want to open up the back of the camera when you have a roll of film in there because that is also going to ruin the film. So make sure to handle it with care. But how do you choose what film roll to use? So here are a few different types of films and how the images could look. And as you probably noticed, all of them have this number on them here, like this one Ilford Delta 100 or Kodak Gold 200. And that number indicates like the ISO of the film. When you're shooting with film cameras, you can't change the ISO on like the camera itself, like you can with modern cameras. Instead, the ISO is determined by the roll of film that you are using. So for example, a Portra, Portra 400 is going to be a lot brighter than let's say something like a Cinestill, Cinestill 50D. And that is extra important if your camera doesn't have the capability to change the aperture or the shutter speed, because then you can't change the light any other way than what, with what roll of film you're choosing. So choosing the right film is important both for uh, the look you want the image to have, but also for the brightness of the image. And a roll of film like this usually costs around 20 bucks or so, give or take. And now that you have chosen your camera and your film roll, we have come to the fun part, which is to shoot. First step is to load the film into your camera. And if you're not sure how to do it, Google is your friend. And if Google can't answer, YouTube is your next best friend. And if you have a camera with manual settings on them, you will probably want to use something like a light meter to be able to expose your shots correctly. And either you have a physical light meter, I don't, then you can just use an app on your phone. I personally like to use one that is called just light meter. It's really simple, just press take reading, point it at towards what you want, choose what, uh, how you wanna expose the shot, lock it in, and then you can lock in your ISO of, let's say you use something like a Kodak Gold 200, then you can lock in, your ISO at 200, press the lock. And now you can change the different settings to make sure that you expose your shot correct. And once you have the settings on your phone, you can transfer those to your camera. And now just snap away knowing that the exposure will be correctly exposed. Oh, way of saying things. Your exposure is correctly exposed. And once the image is shot, you need to advance the film so that you can take another shot. And if your camera doesn't do it automatically, like this one doesn't, then you need to do it manually. Just release the shutter and wind it up until it stops. But once again, it sort of depends on what camera you're using and how to do it. But usually there is somewhere of winding it up after you have shot a image. And that is pretty much it. Now you just rinse, repeat, do it again and expose your whole film and usually you get something like 36 shots uh, from a 35 millimeter roll of film. Or if you're using a half frame camera like this, you get twice as many as I said before. So you would get 72 images. But if you're using a camera that allows for 120 film, you would get a few less shots. It's usually somewhere between eight to 12, I think. And once all of your images has been exposed, then we can go on to the next step. And that is that it is time to get them developed and scanned. And here you pretty much have two different options. 
first of all, either you just send them in and let someone else deal with that thing, or you can do it yourself. And the easiest way is, of course, to just send it in or just leave it at your local camera store. But this way can be quite expensive since you have already spent like 20 bucks on getting a roll of film like this. Then to get it developed and scanned is pretty much 20 bucks each as well. And then add the cost of the film, purchasing the film, and you're looking at something like 50 to 60 bucks. And that is not even accounting for all the snacks you need to eat while you are waiting for your film to get developed. And on top of that, you also need to account for uh, shipping if you're sending it away. You don't have a local camera store that does um, development and scanning. So yes, film photography can be very expensive. But there is another option and that is to do it yourself. But be aware, this is where it gets a little bit mad scientist vibe, but in a good way and it isn't really that bad. But it is going to be cheaper in the long run. It is going to require some upfront cost and take a little bit more time. But if it sounds like fun to you, go for it. I personally haven't tried it myself yet, but I am quite tempted to try it out myself because it sounds like quite a lot of fun to me. So what do you need if you want to do it yourself? Well. First of all, you need to develop the film, and to do that, it involves quite a lot of chemicals and exposing the film to those chemicals without letting any light touching it. So you will need those chemicals, you will need some light-safe box and a bag and stuff like that. And once the film is developed, you have turned them into your negatives, and those negatives need to be scanned to be able to view them on your computer or phone. Well then, to scan those negatives, you need either a film scanner or a setup that you, so that you can do it with your camera. As I said, this is not something I've tried myself, so I'm going to leave a few links down below that you can check out if this is something that interests you. And maybe I will try it myself one day and make a video on that. So stay tuned for that potential chaos and ruined Phil Rose. And that is pretty much it, I think. Oh, there is one more thing that is important to note, and that is that if you send your film rolls in to get developed uh, at by someone else, then they are going to do some minor edits to those images when they are scanning them in. So don't worry, it is okay to edit your images because it always happens. So it is okay to do minor changes to your film photos, in my opinion at least. So don't worry if you get them back and you want to do some minor changes in Lightroom, it is totally fine. But thanks for sticking around, I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.